So I want to talk about also about quantum Markov semigroups. And because we already had a few nice talks about this topic, especially the one by Marius Junge, where he gave nice motivation for the whole Ritchie curvature business. I want to keep my motivation rather short and jump directly into the technical part, so to say, of the motivation. But let's start with a very classical object, which is the heat equation on RD. And for this, it is very well known that the solution UT is an L2 gradient flow curve of the energy that I wrote down here. So one way to understand this is that the L2 gradient of this functional look at the right hand side is just the Laplacian of U. Okay, and this is already quite useful for the so-called energy method in PDE, but now I want to focus on a slightly different viewpoint which was introduced by Felix Otto and also with Kindolero and Jordan namely that the solution of the heat equation can also be understood as a gradient flow of the entropy. Okay, here, as I said, slight change of viewpoint. In the first point, my ut are L2 functions. If I want to talk about the entropy, I'd better have like positive functions. So now ut are probability densities. And in which sense is it a gradient flow of the entropy? Well, that is with respect to the so-called L2 Wasserstein distance from optimal transport, which I wrote down here. So the first formula is probably more well known. This is this earth moving uh, formulation, but later on this fluid mechanics formulation in the second uh, equality actually more useful. And okay, I said the solution of the heat equation is a gradient flow curve with respect to this L2 Wasserstein distance. This doesn't make too much sense without giving details. So one way to understand this statement is this second equality looks like the distance function coming from a metric tensor. And indeed, you can write down a formal metric tensor that gives this Wasserstein distance as a, as a distance function, and then the gradient of the entropy with respect to this metric tensor is once again the Laplacian of U. All right, and now the aim of my talk is to give a kind of non-commutative version of this result of Otto's. And there was already work by Colin and Mars in the finite dimensional case. And here I want to say something about the infinite dimensional case. Okay, so let's come to the setting. Not only did I steal half of my title from Mateusz, I also stole some of the content. So here these quantum Markov semigroups are exactly what Mateusz talked about. So we have a finite von Neumann algebra and a normal faithful tracial state. And PT is a semi-group of UCP maps with a usual continuity assumption. And it also has this tau symmetry condition, which means in particular that this PT extends to a strongly continuous semi-group on all LP spaces between one and infinity. And then, just as in Matthias' talk, we will use this result by Cipriani and Sauvachau that in this case, my generator, my L2 generator of the uh, QMS can be written as d star d, where d is a derivation. The simplest example, so the one that corresponds to Otto's theorem, if I look at the heat semigroup on L infinity or L2 of Rd, 
then my h is exactly the space of tangent vector fields and my d is exactly the gradient operator. But here I want to point out one important difference. When I write, write bimodule, this means of course that I have a left and a right multiplication. In the case of the heat semigroup, these are just the same. There's essentially one canonical way to multiply a function and a vector field. But in general, the left and the right multiplication will be different in our setting. And I should also note that, of course, for everyone working in non-commutative stuff, that's not too surprising that when I go to commutative to non-commutative, nothing like that happens. But here it really is not a feature of uh, non-commutativity, but the same thing that left and right multiplication differ already happens if I have a non-local generator. All right. And then there's one additional assumption we need. So this bimodule H is a bimodule over the form domain intersected with my von Neumann algebra. And this here is the domain of this is a star algebra, but of course, in general, not a uh, weak star closed. And what we want is that the actions extend to normal actions of M on H. This is an additional assumption. And for all of those of, for all those of you who listened to Marius Jung's talk, this is exactly equivalent to uh, assuming that the Carré Duchamp operator maps into a one. Okay, so just a short reminder. This here is the formula for the L2 Wasserstein distance, which is, by the way, due to Benamou and Bernier. And now, if I want to write something similar for QMS, at the first glance, it looks rather obvious what I should do now that I have this differential structure coming from the QMS. So there's a divergence. I'd better replace it by the adjoint of my derivation. Then on the left-hand side, there's some integral over an inner product. There's just one thing that's not so obvious. Namely, here I multiply rho t with vt, as I said, for Euclidean space for tangent vector fields. There's only one way to do it. Now, in the non-commutative setting, I have two ways to do it. So either from the left or from the right. And here, the important, the crucial insight by Colin and Maas was that I shouldn't just take the left or the right multiplication at this place, but really a mean of these two. So. If I write just L of rho for left and R of rho for right multiplication, then I define rho hat as L of rho uh, sharp R of rho. So I take an operator mean of L of rho and R of rho. And in principle, a lot of this theory can be done for any operator mean. But in this talk, I specifically want to take the logarithmic operator mean. And without giving details, it's not so easy to see. But really, this logarithmic in logarithmic mean corresponds to the logarithm in the entropy functional. And this is really what gives me the connection of the QMS, this metric, and the entropy. I can define this metric or write for any operator mean, but it's only the logarithmic mean which really allows me to view the QMS as a gradient flow of the entropy. Okay. And now with these definitions, I can just look at the Bernamou Brunier formula and translate it into my non commutative setting. Okay, so multiplication by rho t is 
replaced by this non-commutative multiplication operator rho t hat. Uh, divergence is actually minus the adjoint of the uh, gradient. So I get a different sign here, but as it's all very similar. Uh, just a short remark, really the interpretation of this continuity equation is also uh, non-trivial to find the correct uh, weak formulation, but in principle it looks all very much analogous to what we did for Euclidean space. And then remember Otto's result, which we want to recover, told us that the entropy is a gradient flow, you know, the heat flow is a gradient flow of the entropy with respect to this L2 Wasserstein distance. So here we will not fully recover this result uh, unconditionally. We need some further assumption. And this is now where we really go, get close to the Ricci curvature business. And when we say PT satisfies, satisfies this gradient estimate, which I wrote here. Okay, so if you have never seen something like that before, it probably doesn't mean too much for you. So let's look at example. First and foremost, again, we look at the heat semi-group. Now, RD is not so super interesting, but let's look at it on a complete Riemannian manifold. In this case, this row hat operator is actually linear in row. Then I can all formulate this as a pointwise estimate which I wrote uh, in the next line. And this estimate is actually very classical. This goes back to Bakri and Emery, and they showed that on a complete Riemannian manifold, this is satisfied if and only if the Ricci curvature is bounded below by K. So in this sense, you can also understand this gradient estimate as a non-commutative Ricci curvature bound for my QMS. And there's also some other examples, really non-commutative ones. So first, if my QMS is generated by, oh, this should be an L. So the generator is identity minus conditional expectation. Then I always have this gradient estimate with constant one half. And if I look at the semi-group generated by the number operator on the Q Gaussian, or the same works on mixed Q Gaussian ones, at least if all Qij are uh, smaller than one absolute value, then I have this gradient estimate with constant one. And these last two results of course, important to give credit. This comes from a work in progress with uh, Jan Maas and Haunan Chang, also from IST Austria. All right, so with this uh, work done, I can now formulate the main results of my uh, talk. Namely, if my QMS satisfies this gradient estimate with constant K, and then we need some additional technical assumption, then PT is a so-called EVIK, that stands for Evolutional Variational Inequality Gradient Flow of the Entropy with respect to our non-commutative class of metric W. Or what that means as a formula is this, what I wrote down here, once again, if you've never seen something like that before, think first of k equals zero, and then this inequality says more or less that um, rho t, so rho t should be pt rho, that this is in the sub-differential of the entropy. So here we are finite dimensional, and the entropy isn't really smooth, so all kind of 
taking derivative gets you into technical problems, but sub differentials and all this stuff from convex analysis works just nicely. And here, once again, this can be understood as Ritchie curvature, namely, again, for Riemannian manifolds or more general, these metric measure spaces people in differential geometry study right now. For these, the heat flow is an EVIK gradient flow of the entropy if and only if the Ricci curvature is bounded below by K. This goes back to Ambrosio, Gili, and Savary. So in this sense, we could say that PT satisfies a AGS curvature bound from below by K. Okay, so if you have never studied Ricci curvature and all that stuff before, you might now wonder why you would even be interested in these kind of gradient flow formulations for QMS or even just the heat semigroup on RD. And the answer, or at least one of the answers, is that once you have such a gradient flow, um, formulation, you can use the tools from Optima Transport to get functional inequalities. So if I have a QMS and it satisfies this gradient estimate, should also be ergodic, but I think there should be uh, extensions to the non-ergodic case, then I get most importantly the modified logarithmic Somolev inequality Poincaré inequality, Talagrand inequality. So, and the takeaway message here shouldn't even be which kind of uh, functional inequalities exactly, but more importantly is that if you look at the proofs, the optimal transport proofs for the heat semi group, you can now run exactly the same machine for your QMS once you have this gradient flow um, formulation, and especially this modified logarithmic Sobolev inequality, which does not follow from a Bakri Emery gradient estimate. The linear one now is super simple to deduce. Um, on a final slide, we get back to yet another notion of Ricci curvature. This is the original uh, optimal transport formulation of, of, of Ricci curvature bounds, which goes back to Lot, Bilani, and Sturm. And here the result is as follows. So if my QMS is an EVIK gradient flow of the entropy, so for example, if this gradient estimate holds, then first any two um, density operators with finite distance are joined by a length minimizing geodesic. So a priori, we don't know if they are geodesic, but under this assumption, we always have geodesic and the entropy is k-convex along any constant speed geodesic. So this is normal convexity with this correction term depending on the case. And once again, this is what Lott, Villani, and Sturm took as a definition for lower Ricci curvature bound. This K convexity of the entropy. And now that my time is almost up, I want to close my talk with a question. We have seen this Bakri Emery type curvature condition, this um, Ambrosio, Gili, and Savare type curvature condition, and finally the Lot, Villani, and Storm one. And we have seen one row of implications. Now, my question is are these actually equivalent? This is known for Riemannian manifolds or more general kinds of metric measure spaces. It is only also known for matrix algebra, but here in this general setting, we don't know. And maybe one could also add how the 
rigid curvature bounds that Marius Junge defined in his talk fit into this picture. And with this question, I want to finish my talk. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>